next one haram yeah. you know to do that <laughs> yeah uh, but all right so now we are still in the panel 5 i'm sorry to have to be uh, decisive about this okay uh, panel 5 still crossing the frontiers and breaking the shackles arab women in different t- contexts this is part 2 of the same panel and it's going to be the cha- uh, chaired by miss we am uh, namo uh, uh, kaldian cultural center usa okay miss we am sorry uh, dr kamal we we are left with the last one though sorry we are left with the last um, paper with uh, oh from- i am so sorry about yeah. this so eager was i to <laughs> on and 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 the- Okay, my apologies. My apologies. Oh, okay. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And Thank this is, you. Oh, my goodness. And it is Iman on, on top Yay. of all of this. And yeah. she is from, from, from Tunisia. How can I do that? <laughs> all right. Sorry. Okay, for the final presentation, thanks to uh, Dr. Kamal, uh, Dr. Iman Benani, Benani from University of South. Uh, Tunisia will be presenting Dying a Thousand and One Times, Honor Killing, and the Plight of Rebellious Arab Women in Emna Rumili, Rumili, Water and Embers. Please, Dr. Iman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gunnar. I would like to thank the, um, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Kamel and uh, all the members of the organizing committee, as well as Andromeda Publishing, for um, planning uh, this prestigious event to um, uh, pay tribute and to honor uh, the acclaimed feminist Nawal um, Sadawi. Um, I think that uh, Professor Omnia Amin yesterday already um, paved the way or predicted my paper when she said in her keynote address that Nawal Sadawi has been killed more than once or has been killed many times. Um, in fact, I think that we all all the women in this vast, big, complex world, we are actually killed every day. But we are also born every day. And every day we have the chance and the opportunity to rise from the ashes, just like some beautiful Lady Lazarus or the Phoenix, exactly. Uh, so, um, On the bookshelf of my library at home lies a collection of stories by Nawal Sadawi entitled Maut Ma'ali al-Wazir Sabiqa, Death of an Ex-Minister. The last story in that book, entitled Jalsa Sirriya, or Secret Tradition, evokes the theme of honor. Everybody knows that Sadawi indicts all forms of oppression and repression against women. One of the injustices and atrocities women are subject to in the Arab world with varying degrees is honor killing. I started from there, I was inspired in some way, but I wanted to look for a novel written by a Tunisian woman writer for, um, in my belief, there is a need, an urgent need to highlight contemporary North African literature in general and Tunisian literature in particular. Uh, there is a growing body of literature which is available, which has been developing and thriving after the so-called Arab Spring. And so it was driven by a researcher's curiosity to see intersection between the famous Egyptian feminists and other fellow writers and feminists in the MENA region. And uh, also it was by chance my hands fell on Jamal Wama or Water and Embers by uh, Amna Mili. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with her, Amna Mili was led as a Tunisian academic writer. She currently teaches at the University of Sousse in Tunisia. She has many publications, critical studies, and also uh, one of them is on Tahr al-Hadad, the great Tunisian thinker and militant. Uh, she has other books on Arab literature and culture studies, short stories. such as Yawmiyat al-Mid Hazin, Diary of the Sad Pupil, Sakhr al-Maraya, Mirror's Rocks, Sayyidat al-Ulab, The Lady of Boxes, for which she got the Book Club Prize, Muhammad Kashaf, Adventures of a Boy Scout, for which she got the Children Literature Prize in 2016. But she mainly also writes novels, uh, Jean Roman, the one I am going to discuss today, War on Embers. She got the Golden Comer Prize for this uh, novel, the debut novel in 2003. It was published uh, first in 2003 and was republished or reprinted in uh, 2019. And Baqi, What Remains, uh, which got both the Reading Jury Special Prize and the Credit Prize in 2014, and Tujen, uh, for which she got the Golden Comer Prize in 2016. 
I'm not really watch novels that prove the Tunisian society on many levels, political, social, cultural, and she engages in discourses that resonate with ongoing discussions of classical but family issues, such as identity, race, agenda, political activism, sexual politics, feminism, and cultural um, belonging. Uh, my paper proposes to look at the gender implications in Amna Media's novel World and Numbers in the context of a contemporary Tunisian society. It tries to highlight the continuity of the manuring patriarchal society and its lasting influence and authority, even beyond the local context. Uh, exactly, the Tunisian community living abroad, especially in Europe, uh, and provide a fitting sample for the study of the complexity of a discourse that fosters hegemony and conservatism. Tunisian families settled in France in particular replicate the practices already fostered and perpetuated in Tunisia. These practices sometimes display a subjugated mix of racism and sexism. Uh, the novel is structured upon the uh, techniques of storytelling and flashback to narrate the tragedy of a young woman who challenged her conservative, authoritative family. And their media's novel set in France and Tunisia and peopled with both male and female characters epitomizing complex portraits relates to the plight of Arab women who are killed twice or even more. Like the novel's main protagonist, who was the victim of honor killing, Arab women often find themselves symbolically killed during their lives because of persecution and injustice. And sometimes also they are literally killed, that is murdered to somehow erase shame. Relying on gender finding this paper offers a feminist read of uh, Mealy's uh, novel, Marab Tumi de Forest, the first one, a theoretical and contextual clues to the paper's topic, and we are going to discuss a bit on a killing in general in Tunisia. The second one focuses on the novel Water and Embers to highlight the implications of this killing of women, which makes them, uh, whether in general, Tunisian women in particular, victims of prejudice, dogma, sexism, and staunch uh, conservatism. So, I would like, first of all, to point out here that I am using the expression honor killing and I'm using the word honor more in the metaphorical, symbolic sense than in the literal one. And I have two reasons. The first one is that notwithstanding the difficulty to find accurate and complete data about honor killing or honor crimes in the Arab region with detailed information, one can neither, neither confidently say that they are very common nor comfortably ascertain that they hardly exist. In fact, as to has above pinpoints in her introduction to Arab women between defiance and restraint, there are no statistics about how many honor killings occur in the Arab world because they are an aberration, occurring far less often than random murders, and here she refers to Saudi Arabia as a uh, region. But saying that honor killing barely exists in its literal sense should not downplay the dangerous and threatening, as well as tragic aspects of the way Arab society and culture deal with this phenomenon. I would like here to refer to the incident of 13 years old Ayam, Tunisian girl who was killed uh, and was a victim of an honor crime in 2014. Um, although I am Tunisian, actually I was really shocked and somehow surprised that when I started to make a research on honor killing about three weeks ago, I never heard of this incident. I didn't even know that it happened. There was a march that was organized in uh, 2014 to uh, condemn what happened to Aya. And it was really kind of, you know, as if I'm rediscovering an atrocious truth in this country. The second reason why I'm emphasizing the symbolic or the metaphorical um, aspect of uh, the honor killing is that even if the killing does not happen, literally it happens symbolically. In many cases, the girl or woman found to infringe the social cultural roles of good conduct and behavior, which can be just even mere talking to foreign boys in danger relationships with them, having affairs with them, eloping with boyfriends, these women or girls are often killed mentally, emotionally, and morally. She is right away punished and tortured, beaten, banished, exiled, disowned, disinherited, humiliated, in short, left to live the death in life, but a castaway that is obliged to leave her or live away, or kept as an unwanted other within the family. Those women would often feel alone, deserted, and rejected, stripped of love and support, and made often to feel a burden, a blemish reminding of trespassed boundaries and transgressive rules. So what is honor? Why is it that delicate and happy at once? The focus on and the most obsession with honor mainly stems from the distinctive features of the Arab Islamic culture. Arab culture is a culture where family honor has required that women be chased and their demon are impeccably modest. And this is from Bint Arab by Ibn Shakir. What is considered inappropriate behavior can range from dating to talking to men on the street or even laughing out loud in their presence and leaving home for reasons other than marriage. 
challenging family and social cause of behavior by threatening her desire for sexual liberation and her assertion of heroin control over her body instantly renders that rebellious woman an outsider, an outcast who must be captured because she brought shame and disgrace and smelted family's honor. Judith Thacker and the family history evidence and the study of the family underscores the linkage between family honor and female conduct and highlights the role fathers and brothers play in policing and even punishing women in this regard. Being the mediator of the legal customs that circumscribe women's activities and perpetuation and equal distribution of power between genders, the Arab family in its traditional version is held accountable for the plight of rebellious non-conformist women. The Arab family's underlying structure unveils its contradictions, for it is usually supportive and oppressive. It generates openness, compassion, generosity, yet on the other hand is controlling and can create struggle with many who feel both attached and resistant to their family and their family. So this is Natalie Hanbal uh, from her article Reflections on Sex. Um, I don't want really to, I try to be brief on this part about honor killing uh, because it's a very broad and complex topic. First of all, there is a controversy about the definitions. Uh, feminists have suggested the use of femicide or feminicide uh, to avoid reference to justification of the murder. Sometimes others uh, use so-called honor killing crime, others use unabased killing. Uh, the definition that the United Nations generally um, prefers or suggests is one that puts uh, honor killing or honor crimes under the broader rubric of violence. And here it includes killing, torture, rape, mutilation, imposed marriage. There are many legal implications like attenuated sentences for the aggressor if he accepts to marry the victim, this is in the case of rape. The religious implications, of course, can be discussed with reference to the notion of sin, uh, sexuality, of course, uh, sexual identity. The social implications, uh, what is important is the um, individual dimension versus the collective dimension of honor. Uh, and I should here also highlight that uh, honor killing is not just associated with one particular religion or culture. It's even more prevalent than we, uh, than we can believe. And it is not just specific to the Arab culture or it is not necessarily related to uh, Islamic culture. Uh, some countries that are generally referred to in studies on honor or searching cases, India, Bangladesh, Turkey, Sri Lanka, Iran, Pakistan, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, of course, with very varying degrees and uh, figures and statistics that are not really always accurate. And also, uh, honor killings discussed within immigrant uh, communities in uh, Europe, uh, in Canada, for example, just want to give an example about 1,000 women and teenagers are killed in 2013, according to the United Nations. Arab feminists have indicted violence against women, the construction of femininity that dictates that honor rests with the girl, with the woman, and that any libertine, which in Dutch comes, any libertine behavior or inappropriate conduct is considered an instance of um, dishonor. Uh, Arab feminism is just my major theoretical framework in the study. Um, and I know that my bright colleague between yesterday and tomorrow referred um, often again to many Arab feminists and they mentioned lots of names. Uh, maybe I'm going to, just going to add to the list of the sisters and daughters of Noel Sadawi and Leila Ahmed and Leila Abdizid and Fatima Mamisi and others, a group of Arab American feminists who are also very interested in discussing the situation of Arab women and can name uh, Suzanne Muadi Darwaj, Nadine Nabir, Evelyn Shakir, uh, Evelyn Sultani, um, Amira Jamrakani, uh, Nadine Nabir, um, Amal Amira, etc., uh, many others. Um, but also, it is important to Tunisian feminism. And we cannot talk about Tunisian feminism without uh, making reference to Tahrir Haddad, who is uh, the um, notable scholar and thinker and who wrote Our Women in Sharia and Society, published in 1930. Just to very quickly an overview, brief overview of some Tunisian feminists, Wadi Haddad, Nabiha bin Milad, a pioneering Tunisian women's rights activist and independence, who was a leader in the press for women's rights in Tunisian independence from French colonialism. Uh, Bashira bin Raj, Tunisian women's rights activist, she founded and chair of the Muslim Union of Tunisian Women. Uh, Nora Borsali, Tunisian academic journalist, writer, literary critic, and film critic, as well as a trade unionist and human rights activist. And others like Sana bin Ashur and Esma bin uh, Of course, there are also some other names in Tunisian literature, women who write about uh, women, the body, identity, the revolution culture. I can name Amal Mukhtar, Masouda, Abu Bakr, uh, Fathiyah Hashmi, and uh, Fatma bin Mahmoud. And of course, 
uh, Anne Namilius Letty, who wrote Water and Embers, and who embedded or included in this novel uh, what I would call stories that kill. In this second part, I would like to focus on the symbolic killing, uh, of course, in addition to the literal, uh, symbolic killing of women, and uh, because somehow they trespass borders and they cross you know, certain um, spaces that they are actually asked not to cross. Uh, this is a quote from Benaul King. I came back uh, to Tunisia motherless and departed from it voiceless. Uh, the protagonist, Amel, is killed more than once. Uh, she is, I can say even that she is killed about 1,001 times uh, uh, in the novel. Uh, why? Because uh, this is a story of a Tunisian family living in France, uh, father, mother, and uh, children, and the uncle lives with them, that is, the mother's um, uh, brother. Uh, the girl is just surprised in the streets kissing a boy, and uh, that was the start of her tragedy. She was beaten, she was tortured, she was, you know, um, uh, punished, etc. And of course, the family in Tunisia heard about it, and it was like, oh, shame. How telling that the writer uses the Christian symbol of the cross to describe the tragic situation of her protagonist and her predicament. Amel is flagellated by two cultures to which she should be comfortably, or she should be comfortable belonging to. And here's taken, this is taken from the book. Amel seemed crucified on a cross where Tunisia and France intersect, leaning with one part of her body on one and with another part on the other. One grips her so she tangents her hands to the other to set her free. One causes her to bleed while the other waves to her, bow and release. Each arm of the cross lays heavy on her, weighing her down with suffering, makes her bear the burden of the country. This is my translation. Amel is killed by two countries in the novel. First, she is killed by France, the host country. How is she killed? Because in the novel, uh, the events that are related is that there is one racist uh, drug addict. Uh, um, French uh, person named Pascal in the novel who shares the uh, building with these uh, families and he lives in the, his apartment and one day he just took the rifle and that he uh, put bullets in the body of her mother and her ankle and he killed them. So France killed Amal because it killed her mother and ankle brutally thus depriving her of affection support and the chances of reconciliation with them. Um, it killed her, uh, Francis killed her, who in the attempt to defend and protect her deepened the chasm between her and her family. Francis almost humiliated her by reminding her that she and the Arab cultural immigrant community she comes from are to blame, are a burden, as I suggested, besides the ethnocentric perspective. France has become filled with disgust. One of the French women at the association who took the charge of ML after she, she left, that is, her house, uh, her uh, family's house. Uh, this woman said when the letter took the French newspaper that published her incident to that woman in an attempt to define her family or culture and correct the misconceptions and prejudice about Arabs, Muslims, and immigrants made even a gross and exaggerated by the French press. Uh, the French press, when it uh, dealt with the incident of this girl, they said, look at the racism uh, in Arab culture, and you know, this comes from Islam, which considers colored people half slaves, etc. And as I said, this is a consolidation of a Eurocentric vision which claims superiority and which uses the, uh, or has clearly uh, hegemonic evidence. Uh, the community she comes from are to blame. They are a burden. Uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, yeah, this repeated. The house country's double standards here, support versus humiliation. That is France, the country, the land of democracy, the land of light, supports you, but at the same time humiliates you, helps you, but then again stigmatizes you tries to tolerate you, but uh, cannot uh, help in you know, hiding the racism it has against you, which makes living in it quite a challenge. Uh, the slow death continues because the protagonist is torn between two cultures belonging to the cruel mother country with its or the clan's rules and codes, their judgment, their punishment, and the belly tender host country, which in appearance is welcoming, but in reality is repulsive and uh, hostile. But Amel is not killed by France, she is killed by Tunisia, the home country. Uh, she is uh, killed even an early, very early death because she's assigned to a specific gender sphere and made to embrace her body specific code of behavior, which is defined by cultural construction of femininity. The household of chores, they are for Amel. Zahra, uh, or Zohra, her sister, uh, describes uh, Amel's misfortune. She tells about her succumbing to traditional roles of women from an early age. Quote, she uses it to do household chores at an early age. I remember how she used it to stand on a chair to reach the dishes 
keep them the sink and wash them. The idea of romanticizing uh, marriage, and this is the role of her mother, Emma's mother, when she keeps telling her about the dowry details, how beautiful are her clothes, that she's going to buy a beautiful and luxurious tableware for her uh, from France, and she's preparing her, kind of preparing her for the marriage life that she's going to have afterwards, and which even consolidates the equivalent passive uh, woman or housewife uh, portrait, which is tailored for her. Now, uh, Emma is also killed uh, by Tunisia uh, on the following level, when the family indicted her, the immediate family, her mother and uncle and brother, and the extended family, which is even worse or more cruel. And when we say extended family here, I mentioned the grandma, the aunts, the uncles, the larger clan of Estefi, who are, this is the name of the clan, Estefi is the family, they are ultra conservative people, in addition also to the neighbors, the acquaintances. Uh, there is an incessant reference to breeding females and how it brings about only problems. I mean, in the book, this recurs a lot. Look at what a female can do. Look what a girl can do. Take care of your other daughter unless uh, she does or uh, follow the same path as her sister. The intensity of the acquisition of a man has a gender, race, and class implication. Uh, the problem with this um, accusation, with this indictment, is that uh, according to this family, uh, and then uh, infringed codes or dishonored the family, not only because she kissed the boy in the street, but also because the boy is a French and he is colored, he's an African guy. Uh, and the word that is used to refer to this hierarchy and this racial posture in the novel is how come uh, she, uh, or how come he dares kiss the letu, the letu from Lenda, uh, which means has like the um, prestigious position of um, um, a countess or a duchess or noble woman. So how come, I mean, how dare he? Uh, and this is like a very important uncovering of the uh, racist work in St. Tunisian society and uh, the novel. Now, the moral psychological punishment that Amel also was subject to in the novel, the disavowal, the rejection, the disowning, the low thing, and especially they kept torturing her, reminding her that she is responsible for her mother's distress. All of this, of course, is in addition to the literal killing when uh, Hanna Shbila, and uh, Hanna Shbila, this is the name or reference to the character of the grandma in uh, the novel, uh, Hanna means grandma, and Shbila, this is the first name of the grandma. Hanna here, this is a word used in Tunisian dialect. Uh, when we say like uh, Hanini, this is my grandpa, and Hanati, this is my grandma. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the words, I mean, they remind of the word in Arabic, which is uh, Hanna, this affection. Uh, but of course, Unfortunately, the grandma in the novel is totally the opposite. She nearly choked her granddaughter to death, and she was like portrayed like a like an evil uh, grandma. I'm and I'm afraid, uh, sorry, I'm afraid you have uh, four minutes left. Uh, okay, I will try to go quicker. Now, the aftermath, Amal is stigmatized forever. She has a lasting trauma, fear, anxiety, loss of self-confidence, indelible sadness. She lost her voice. Uh, when I say lost her voice, I mean, when uh, the grandma uh, tried to choke her, choke her granddaughter to death, uh, her vocal cords were damaged too severely. She lost almost her voice and became somehow mute. And this is very symbolic, of course. And then also lost the keys of her body, uh, the lasting feelings of loneliness, estrangement, uneasiness, loss of hope. She's completely devastated and forever uh, anxious. I am going to, uh, I don't know, uh, just I wanted to uh, make a reference to the fact how the other women of the novel also were killed. For example, her grandma, who tried to kill her also. Although she is cast in the novel as a strong and sporting and fearless and authoritative and wavering courageous old woman, there was no uh, a moment of weakness in the novel when she was surprised by her king, Aisha, crying because a neighbor, and she describes her, Bint Salem, the loose, the base woman, asked her, why Amel does not marry the African guy she fell into for? Isn't that better than living with him in Haram? The grandma is humiliated and mocked because her granddaughter brought her or them uh, shame. Uh, so that's why she, dec she decides to kill her. Um, Mona, for example, uh, this is uh, the cousin of ML, is also killed in the novel. She's living a death enough. She's married to a bitter man full of complexes. She becomes angry and attacks Aisha when she learns the letter that tarnished her honor through gossip. You dare disturb my honor in front of people. 
pretend they in the neighborhood shopkeeper and molested her. Mona joins the other women in incriminating ML, the harlot, and fights courage in facing her husband, who brings her disgrace with his misconduct, found to be an adulterer and pedophile. Shall I bring your boy from the street, she says to him. She insults him, but he insults her, calling her whore because she dares express her desire directly and ask for her rights as a woman, a gross misdeed and a modest proposal according to cultural standards. Um, uh, Zuhra, Amanda's sister, is the only rebellious and strong young woman of the novel. She keeps shouting, vive la France. She's convinced of the country's democratic climate and its liberating atmosphere. She is the only woman in the novel who does not indict her sister. Uh, on the country, she indicts the culture, the bulk weapons of the tribe, a Safi's clan, the family, and their morally authoritative punitive codes, precepts, and taboos. She says, I used to hate some of the family. Now I hate all of them. Her independent feminist spirit drives her to argue against what she considers the family's interference in her sister's affairs. Why would you poke your nose in her private affairs? Should she give you the keys of her mind, heart, and body? The Anna issue kills her indirectly. Uh, Zainab uh, is uh, the spinster in the novel. Uh, she is killed because they keep reminding her of the lag and that how she did not get a husband, etc. She's surprised alone with a man in her parents' house, an intimate teen. Her mother reprimands both her and the man and asks them to bury the story so as to preserve the daughter's honor, save the family's reputation, and avoid disgrace. She said to her, either the story dies here or you die. Uh, but yeah, there are many who are killed in this um, this uh, novel. I just uh, finished this part with Wahida. Wahida, this is narrator who tells the story. Uh, she's a very intriguing character, and she really uh, roused my curiosity. She's the intellectual woman who is too afraid she loses her independence, strength, and self reliance. She suppresses her feminine sensitivity and goes too far in repressing her feelings and spontaneity. Less she is calculated with the stereotype of the weak, passive, submissive woman to the point she becomes resistant to passion and almost unreceptive to love. This is what a, a man who wants to have like a relationship with her uh, says to her, how awful are the women of good? Um, I'm going to skip a bit just to respect uh, time. Now, um, before the conclusion. Amen, just, your time is over. I think it's better to give a conclusion. Just Yeah, okay. I just wanted to have another story telling. Um, uh, just, yeah, before the conclusion, I would like to say that in this novel, we have um, a kind of storytelling that is, reminds me of the those Russian dolls, the Matryoshka, that is one story within a story within a story. And uh, we have, like, with high time, we have a Tunisian Shahrazad who is going to tell the stories of all these women and tell her own story through them also. The story is killed, but they also provide a healing power for all these characters. Um, I'm going to conclude uh, because I'm already... Um, what I remember is a novel without an end or an ending. It finishes with a, a series of questions and inqu inquiries left to ponder and meditate over. Like the embers that keep the fire beneath the ashes, those questions insist and persist. It really invites the reader to think and reflect again and again on the situation of Arab and Tunisian women in a changing society and during confusing times. The book republished in 2019 is likely to be read with fresh eyes, seeing the radical changes that have occurred in Tunisia and the Arab world, namely the Arab Spring, and the complex discourse and revolutions, change and transformation that have impacted criticism in the MENA region and uh, beyond. The discussion of notions such as feminism, securism, religion, culture, emancipation, identity, politics. The book presents to Mili her plot teams and characters as agents and voices of change, in that the writer's narrative questions existing ideologies and calls for a revision of power structures and social uh, relations. The book uh, openly asks, is it possible to have both the motherhood of Tunisia and the fatherhood of uh, France? The situation of women still needs to change in Arab society, despite a few developments on some levels in some countries. It becomes even it becomes even more urgent than ever, seeing the threats of a growing fundamentalist discourse, an increasing Islamophobia, escalating racism, and developing uh, xenophobia. We need writers like Emma Mili and others similar to her in determination and vision to keep writing about women, freedom, family, motherhood, racism, the body, love, ideology, forgiveness. So that societies develop and mature, minds grow and become more open, and individuals accept to change and flatten differences and avoid conflicts for a more harmonious relationship with the other in order to have a happier life. Literature, 
such as hers and many other women writers in the MENA region and beyond, is the water that will cleanse misunderstanding, put down the fires of racism, sexism, and fanaticism, and keep us, the readers, intellectually, emotionally, and morally hydrated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please uh, give her another round of applause. And all other panelists, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you. That was a great discussion. That was a um, that was great insights uh, on uh, those kind of uh, frontiers, living in between, having mixed race, interracial uh, marriage, or you know, suffering from all those traumas of both cultures. So that was really interesting. So I think uh, we need to move uh, quickly to the next panel. And thank you so much. That was a great opportunity for me. To hear uh, you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Gulnaz. And thank you, Dr. Himian, very mm -hmm. much. I was waiting for a statement at the end to clinch this powerful image of water and uh, fire and water, and you did not disappoint me. Thank you very much. It yeah. was really lovely, cleansing the inside with water and what is the other one? And distinguishing, I think, uh, the fire of hatred or something. Yeah, uh, and put down fire, and put down fire. And put I, down I, fire. Put really down fire. wonderful and very powerful. Because of course, <laughs> fire, <laughs> yes, fire and water and are, and are natural elements all the way coming to us, all the way from ancient Greece. All right, we'll move it's on. It's uh, a catharsis, purification. It, it is, it is, both, both of them, actually. Yeah. So it's either by fire or by water, as you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, a powerful, uh, powerful image, I must say. 